Hello, everybody. Happy holiday month of the spookiness. Um, I got a fun idea that I want to see writers' shelves and I want to see their Halloween decorations. And the first person that said yes was the wonderful Kathy Koja. And there she is by one of her shelves. That's not her only shelf, but it's her. No, I am, I am super shelved up. But this shelf is, is here for a reason. And I try to, to curate my shelf because we don't have time to look at all my shelves. And I don't have time to clean my shelves. So <laughs> that's the other reason we're looking at this shelf. There are, in, this, in the room that we're in now, I'm looking right now at a bookcase that has a stuffed bat on it and an old candle, an ivy plant, a certain amount of cat hair, and that's why we're looking at this shelf instead, because there, and because I curated the objects. So, so tell me, will, tell me about, tell me about your shelf here. We have the oh, Stoker Award there. That's, that's the. Let, let's start, we'll start at the top. We'll start at the top. We'll, I can't actually see the top. On, that's okay. I'll bring it down. Okay. Da, 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 da. At the very top of this is this Whoa. insane silver bouquet in this weird salvaged pewter kind of faux pitcher that doesn't actually have a hole for any liquid to come out. So it was clearly waiting for dead flowers. This was a prop and a gift from the Future is Fun, which is an event I did in January of this year. Remember back to January, like a hundred thousand years ago? <laughs> Another life. I did an event, and the people were invited to dress in silver, and many of them did, and this was a gift from a florist and a floral artist. And because the leaves are already dead and sprayed with silver, they can never die. So that's why it lives on the top of the shelf. I love that. That's so beautiful. It's super cool, and and so that's why we have to take comfort in in uh, immortality, even if we're covered with silver paint. It might keep us alive forever. <laughs> um, next is my religion, fun, my fun letters that were also a gift. They also say F you, because you can't say fun without F you. <laughs> my fun letters remind me that if I'm not having fun with a project, if I'm not having fun with something that I'm writing or a show that I'm making or whatever, it's not going to be fun for other people. Yeah. And I think sometimes all creatives, we're so used to slogging through our problems and like, there comes a point where you have to ask yourself every time, am I having fun with this? Is this still fun? And I've done that in rehearsals. We've stopped dead and said, we're not having fun now. What's wrong? And backtrack to where it was fun and then try to go in that direction because that's, I think people don't maybe give as much weight to the idea of like fun, like our art is supposed to be serious. And, but, but joy is the most serious thing there is. It's just essential. And fun is like the baby sister of joy. So <laughs> If you have fun, then you have a fighting chance of also having joy, and that is the best. So that is my religion. On the next shelf are my two books that came out this year, Velocities and The Cipher, because I keep them close to my heart and because I do readings from them, and I like to have a reading copy that I can, you know, bend the pages and break the spine and screw up if I have to. Yeah, I love that. I love having the one cop, the copy. I do too. And I think so big. those are bigger than I thought they would be. They are. They're robust. They're robustly sized. Wow. So yeah, there's a right. lot of fun in here. There's just a lot of fun hole. Oh. And I like to be able to kind of use them the way I would use a script, right? And right and bend things up and underline and because things when you as you know very well when you do readings some of the things that are on the page are not they work better on the page than they're ever going to work vocally and you yeah. have to kind of things 
or some things just take too long to explain. You're not going to go back and go, well, this thing is about this guy, but actually it's like, you know, yeah, that guy that's now. bore everybody to tears. With right. Them. Everyone's dead. So like, how, do, like, how, do you, how do you decide that? Like, how do you decide what kind of, what segments to read? Like, the, I mean, it probably depends on the type of reading, but. It depends on how much time. I always try to keep it shorter rather than longer because even with the most compelling, even though now we're all, all we ever do is stare at screens now, but someone reading to you is a much less compelling experience on a screen to me. Yeah, than someone sure. Doing. It's just not the same. Well, you're losing all that energy of like being in the room. And losing the back and forth because reading to a live audience is totally different. Um, also, somehow sucks. what I hate about the Zoom readings, is is um how everybody has to mute their microphones and like yeah. in a live reading like that is such a huge thing is like hearing that audience feedback those are the moments like we're always a lot especially as writers i mean you do theater that's a lot more you know interactive but but like as a writer you're just alone constantly and that's like your one moment to like hear oh did that land like and sometimes people will laugh or do something when you didn't even think it would happen, but like it's exactly. that organic return and then it gives you energy and you don't get that in Zoom. So it feels like weirdly sterile, you know? And right, it feels, and it feels muffled. It's like you're playing, you know, a trombone with a mute or whatever the thing <laughs> is, right? You're not able to get across, you know, on the one hand, we're able to access time with people and attention from people that we could never do before. Okay, this is great that we can reach a bunch of people and people are comfortable with this technology, but it's also, yeah, it, it's, it's sterile. And so when I'm, I'm trying to read things, I'll read stuff aloud first to check and see what does this sound like being read aloud? And your voice will change things too. I do that with the stuff I write. I read everything out loud before. That's my last run through. Your voice changes, your mouth will say things that make it better. It's a different part of your brain engaged. It's, I just started doing it about five years ago and changed my fucking life, 10 years ago, whatever, but it changed my life. It's like, okay. Yeah, yeah. And especially parts of the cipher where, with Velocities, it's a short story collection, so it's a lot easier. You can go, okay, this story kind of fits this, space this story kind of fits i just did one for um a public library who wanted to keep things dark but not like ah dark so it's like okay it was a little bit of a challenge but i found a story in velocities that was very disturbing but not overtly like in your fucking face so that worked what's out your well. what's your favorite section of do you have a favorite section of the fun hole to read that you just enjoy the most reading? I go back and forth. I go back and forth. And depending on how much, a lot of it is to do, how much time do I have and who am I talking to? And some audiences, it's like they want you to come out, you know, with a wiffle bat. And some of them want you to come out with a tire iron. And so it's, I can do that. I'm good. I'm good either way. So besides them on the shelf is this, which I love so much. It is uh, a card, a postcard image that Rick Leader, who is an amazing artist and also is my husband, created for me to include every time someone buys a print book from me, they get this little card with a note. Oh, I love that. And I, and I love that the image is so mysterious. It's of mm -hmm. a a young person, you can't really tell a gender, you can't really tell much about them, but it's like a young person staring through these glittery curtains. And to me, that says everything about what reading and creativity is about. We're staring through these glittery curtains. We don't know what we're going to see. And this, this person is very intent and not like, you. they're super into whatever they're looking at. We can't tell what they're seeing. They don't look happy. They don't look sad. They just look super absorbed. So I love that. That's beautiful. That would look great blown up as a poster. I know, right? I was thinking of having a big giant one for in here just yeah, to have it. Do that. And because I love it too. I love it so much. Um, what is next? Next is my Stoker guy 
for the cipher with his little door that I like to open and shut sometimes. This, and this is really cool. This is one of the best looking awards I think out there. It just- I know, it's, what is it made up? Can I see it a little closer? It's heavy as fuck. I yeah, mean, you could like someone it. With it legitimately. There's so much detail. It's and it's incredibly detailed. The only downside is that sometimes it gets so covered in like floating cat hair that's disgusting to say, but it's true that I have to like like sandblast it off. But it is. It's incredibly detailed, and there are little things happening and all the different cool. levels and the and when you open the door, it has your name and it and the book that you. Oh, got your it's super oh, cute that is incredible and then you can go think and shut the door so what is it made out of? i don't know uh, some kind of a resin that's super heavy though it's like is it like easy to break it like it seems like it would be easy to break it i would be a little worried about this part because yeah. it's really thin this little spire yeah um uh, Probably yes, it would probably be brittle. It is not something you want to hurl at somebody. <laughs> so, uh, that, you, I, I, I would love to imagine what that moment would be where you're that pissed at someone, you're hurling your stoker at them. And you're hurling your stoker. It would probably make an excellent murder weapon. I'm not saying you do that, but you probably, you could definitely take somebody's eye out with this if you did <laughs> it right. But yeah, I don't, I don't recommend. And you know, when, when you have a nice award, you don't want to commit murder with it really, not really. Yeah. Um, next to that is, I don't know how well this will show. This is a puppet person that someone made for me on the set of my immersive show Under the Poppy, which was a, a, I adapted my novel of the same name. And she was a puppet person and a puppeteer and made this little puppet out of a, I don't even know why we had this little skull lying around, but with the skull and a piece of material and a pair of corn tongs, she made this puppet and I loved it so much that I got a little stand for it so I could always look at it. What's the little... Oh, Next to the little death's head puppet is this little guy, this little oh, fox guy. Oh, fox, fox, okay. He's a little fox and he was a gift from... Maurice Meyer, who is a dear friend and a writer that I love a lot. And we have kind of a fox thing going on together. So he was a Christmas gift one year. And, and because one of the characters in Under the Poppy is often referred to as if he is a fox or he's very, he's got that vibe going on. He's got that kind of, you know, trickster kind of vibe. And so he belongs with, with the little death head. And while we're on the subject of animals, my favorite cup is my Mercy for Animals travel mug. They're my favorite animal organization because they help farmed animals in particular who are intensely abused in this country and pretty much everywhere. So they said, who needs the most help? Okay, we're gonna help them. And so you could also kill someone with this, but again, I don't recommend <laughs> I'm really in a killing mood today. I'm not sure why. It's the I, season. I, it's the season for, for It is the season, right? It's the season for murder. Really season. <laughs> so mm. you when I asked you, you I, you said you don't really so you don't really decorate like for Halloween. Or or is, did you just not do it this year? I really don't. I used to and then I kind of stopped. Um, in the neighborhood that I live in. We, for a while, there was a lot of construction on the street and we stopped having a lot of trick-or-treaters because a lot of it was kind of, or people weren't doing it because they were Scrooge or something, I don't know. And so we stopped really getting a lot of kids and it was sort of depressing. So I did get pumpkins and then I just give them to the squirrels afterwards. But yeah, and this year I assume I'm gonna put out a bowl of candy and whoever shows up, I hope they take it. I don't think there will be trick-or-treating this year. Yeah, so. no, that's not happening this year. It's not a thing. But if anybody's bold enough to show up, there will be, you know, some Hershey's miniatures and they can they can take them. But so for this Halloween, I bought myself this lovely black candle. And its scent is black forest, which I have no idea what the black forest actually smells like, but 
Probably not like the candle. <laughs> what does it right. smell it, like? It doesn't smell like this candle, right? It probably smells a lot better. What does it but, smell like? What does that candle smell like? Can you tell what notes are in it or anything? It says, what does it say? It says, um, I have a couple Doug, here. Douglas fir and ebony wood with, um, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not feeling, I might be feeling the ebony wood fir, all fir candles, all of those kind of tree candles, they almost never smell like the thing. Yeah, not remotely, not remotely. Yeah. Not even close. They're always sweeter than they should be, or I don't know what their problem is. I have this, this fabulous candle, blueberry Ooh, pie. Hey. Does it smell like blueberry pie? Oh, yes. It actually does. It actually literally smells. I really love, uh, I'm a huge fan. I actually got this, uh, oh, this is White Barn. Oh, that's the brand. Um, they have them at uh, Bath and Body Works. Um, I'm such a fan of, of this line of candles. They have like, um, there was this other one that I can't find anymore. I don't know if they're not making it, but it was a baguette scented candle Ooh. and it 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 smelled like it literally smelled like like a delicious Whoa. baking okay, that's pretty it was so I, awesome. and that this um cool magazine that i just subscribed for uh is giving out incense as part of their i believe it's called black telephone <laughs> i'm excitedly awaiting this package that will contain not only the fabulous literature but also incense so you may know something about that. I'm gonna make the incense. I'm so Whatever excited. You. I've never made incense before, but I have a friend that does, that has, and he had like a lot of the stuff. He actually just had to buy more. He, had, he just had to buy, the only scent he didn't have was frankincense. And he was mm. like, wow, this is like really expensive. Like frankincense, I didn't, that's so weird. Like frankincense for some reason is expensive like of all the scents, but. It's a super old scent too. I mean, that people have been using that for, God, thousands of years. Isn't it, a, isn't it harvested from a tree or a? I don't even know what it is. <laughs> I want to say, oh, maybe that's wrong. I thought it was from, not like a tree tree, but like a, not a bush either. I don't know. Frankincense tree, that's in my mind, but I don't know why. It's apparently a good anti-inflammatory. And it's an indelible smell. It's such a great scent. Yeah, it's it's like the, I mean, I like it because it's like the quintessential, like mystical scent. Oh yeah. Um, but actually all the, all the whole, uh, the idea as well as the scents that compose the incense were um, Lindsay Lerman's, my co-editor of the magazine. I was like, let's come up with something, you know, what's a fun promo thing? I came up with doing a little blank book and I, yeah. I got those. Um, I'll grab one right in here. Yeah, those are super cool too. They're so cute. They're a little small. You know, I wasn't gonna, you know, people are getting them for free, so, you know. <laughs> well, and they're, they're a notebook too. I mean, yeah, no. They're, cute. they're, they're kind of like an address book size but it's right. so, but they're really nice i was surprised they're like it's like a really like soft velvety finish and um and it's got this and yeah and it has the little like that right thing, and it has like nice this cool thing if you want to like close it up you know so it's really cool but uh lindsay actually was like let's do incense i'm like how I don't even know like, how to do that. Do that? <laughs> um, unfortunately, I have a weirdo friend that loves to make candles and incense and stuff like that. So he's actually going to be coming at the end of this month and we're going to be making those incense bundles. So I'm super psyched for that. And that's a really nice, I mean, it, it all hangs together thematically. It's like, here is Black Telephone, here is, and I love that, I mean, not to get off on Black Telephone, but I love that you chose that name because I love that fucking poem. And the Black Telephone is cut off at the root. The voices just can't worm through. I know. 
Sorry. If I kill one man, I kill, I kill two. two. The vampire who said he was you and drank my blood for a year, 10 years. Yeah. Oh. No, that, it's just that. I, at one point, I had written, I was not able to finish it, but I had written a novel based on, I wrote a story called Anna Lee, and it's the one of the maids in the Dracula story who live with Lucy and her mother. And it's told from the point of the view of the maid. And she's a young woman. She's 16. And this is when Van Helsing, who I've always hated with a passion. <laughs> this is when Van Helsing is like questioning the maids and saying like, how did the, why is the window broken? And how, you know, now Miss Lucy is dead, blah, blah, blah. And we see that something's going on with this girl. And as the story goes on, she's the one who let Dracula in because she was like brutalized by her stepfather, who's like, a church deacon and he's like this big religious asshole like Van Helsing and she hates him and her real father was lost at sea and she always wanted to see the world but she couldn't because now she's stuck in this town with this verger who is her stepfather and all this stuff and at the end she basically reveals you know it was me and she's like what are you gonna do put me in jail you know, jails have windows too. I mean, I'm so far past caring. There's, you cannot kill me in any way that matters, right? There's nothing you can do to me. And I wanted to make a novel out of that, a YA novel of, and the, the girls had like super father things going on. And that's why Dracula was like this one girl's, he was a father to her. He was her father figure. And I don't know why I couldn't, I just could not finish that book. So it still exists, it's called Planchette. And oh, cool. it's still somewhere in my hard drive, but I was not able to finish it. Maybe you'll but get yeah. that. Maybe you'll get yeah. What's funny is like, that was my inspiration, Black Telephone. And, um, but in my mind, what the, like, we're like, I, I, I picture the Black Telephone of the magazine as like this astral telephone booth where oh. the writers that submit like they go in there in their head and they're getting like transmissions from the beyond and also like the idea of communicating you know so i'm really fascinated with the idea of communicating with spirits spirits communicating with us and this black telephone being like this this sort of secret place where you can communicate the things that are hard to communicate you know so that's kind of like my vision of the magazine or the things that you have no words for the things that you can't put into words or the things that are very painful and difficult to put right. into words but you can say them on the black telephone it's, it's like this space. Thought the concept of the the catholic concept of the confessional yeah is such a great idea even though it was never used correctly but to think that here is this place where you can go and theoretically, Judgment. not like judging you, but that you can get this shit out of you and say, here are all the bad things that I did. And when you walk out, you have like a plan for restitution and you've been able to tell someone who doesn't know who you are and doesn't, in that sense, give a shit. It's, it's. It could be incredibly therapeutic if it wasn't for all the guilt involved with it, which kind of defeats the purpose of it. It totally did. It just ruins everything. But yeah, besides that, it would have been a great idea, right? Without the like, oh, you know, but that's like back to like the easy fixes thing we were talking about before we started yeah. recording. It's like, okay, well, you go say, you know, 12 Hail Marys and, you know, hit yourself with a something and. Right, with a flagellate. And yeah, and and you're, you're all, right? and that will somehow like get the sin out, and it, it's such a primitive way of thinking, looking at it now. But I totally understand how that would make sense, you know, because you're like well, it would feel like you did. I mean, the same way that when you shoplifted from a store, a little Betty, we're going to make you take it back and say sorry. I mean, it is a very primitive kind of restitution thing. But it totally leaves out the people that you hurt. It's like saying, you have to right. say sorry to God. It didn't yeah. hurt God. It like, hurt that God punched in the face or whatever. It right. Maybe go just, just like, you know, try to fix it. And if you can't fix it, just try to not do any more 
harm. Like a, lot of, a lot of the things that people would be, I mean, if you're like, say you're, you know, in a loveless marriage and you're having an affair, like, uh, you know, that's not going to get fixed until you get a divorce, you know, but you no. can't get divorced. So there's no and if you if you go, I mean, there and I know this because I was brought up as a good Catholic girl, but if you go and you do your confession with an insincere, there's something like ins insincere purpose of amendment, like you're fucking lying. Like, I promise not to have an affair anymore with the hot guy at the grocery store. But you know, you totally are. It's like your absolution doesn't take because you were totally lying. And again, you're not hurting God by having an affair with the guy at the grocery store. You're hurting everybody and yourself. Right. Right. That's it's not like, the point. It's not, oh, I displeased the father, you know. Right. It's like, he do it. It. Go hang out with the guy at the grocery store and see if that works out better. Yeah. There. So we solved that problem. <laughs> <laughs> what's left? Oh, what's left on my shelf? Two things are left on the shelf. This is my, if it was darker, we could see this better. Beautiful. But this is, this is my great dark factory sign. My light up sign. It comes from another show. My great friend and collaborator, Rachel Harbour, was doing a show. And I was playing this sort of awful, it doesn't matter, but I was playing a very awful character and at the end of it. And I love this thing so much, we kept changing the words. And she said, you should take it, it's yours. So I... What are all the symbols? What do those all mean? The symbols on the bottom? Because Dark Factory is, takes place in a club. And so it's the music, it's the sex, it's the being turned upside down. You don't really know what the fuck is happening. And there's the black balloon for surprise. Because oh, nice. things will happen in this club that will surprise you very much indeed. I love, so that, I love the idea of a black balloon. That's interesting. And the, so many people go to clubs and especially people who have had experiences with and a lot of it happens in and has happened in the techno world where people go to you know super hardcore techno clubs and just dance for especially in berlin where they can go for hours and hours and go for days if you want and it's having this very transcendent experience it's about dancing and it's about fucking and it's about drinking but maybe not you're not there to get wasted and get out of yourself you're there to be with other people and to be in that transcendent, what, in that hum, in that vibration together. And in, in a totally not cheesy way, I mean, that's what it's for. And I've read so many people's testimonials saying, I felt like this was happening, or I felt like I finally understood what I was supposed to do with my life, or I felt so free from, you know, I know that my real world problems are still out there, but I just felt freer and now I feel like I can confront them better. Or just, I had an amazing time, I'll never forget it. And clubs are a lot like churches. I right, think. yeah, I mean, that, that made me think about like pre-Christian pre rites that yeah. were a lot more orgiastic and like during this, well, Saturnalia and stuff, like during this time and then during, during Christmas time, like that yeah. was, and then during the summer solstice, basically all the, you know, all the shifts, all the seasonal shifts are times yeah. of embracing liminality and, um, you know, letting that wildness out. And it, it serves such a important psychological purpose as well as a spiritual purpose. <clears throat> and both, right? Right. Yeah. And acknowledges that those wild impulses are part of us all the time. Yeah. And, and they're not bad. <laughs> You can't get into it all the time because you have to, you know, You would whatever. wreck your life. You would wreck your, you know, you wouldn't get anything done or you would, you know, yeah. Well, right. You have to feed the cat. I mean, you can't yeah. be having a wild orgy all the time because the cat will not be fed. So, yeah. okay. And that's, I, literally, and that's literally the only reason why you can't. Pretty, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only reason that matters, right? Besides that. But yeah, they to recognize that that impulse is there and that the DJs had a lot of, it wasn't as much about, look at me, I'm this banging DJ. It was about, I am trying, and anyone who has ever danced when a really superior DJ is playing, it is all about from 
maybe about here or to your knees. It is not talking to you here. It's talking to you in this totally different language that you're free to respond in. And it is all about response. It's them trying to communicate with you and you giving that energy back. It's not going, oh, this is a DJ. It's like, oh my God, this, and that facilitates that, you know, wow, that, that crazy. Yeah, I, I think that does more for people than, you know, something like going to a confession. You know, you're releasing all this stuff in your body. And that's where it yeah. is a safe and welcoming place where everybody is there and it's not about you know you might meet someone and have sex with them whatever but it's not about how can i use somebody or how can i you know or how can somebody use me it's a, it's about the exchange ideally the exchange and like, of energy. yeah and like channeling energies that are bigger than you you know letting them flow through your body and letting them flow through your body and not being afraid because knowing you're in this kind of protected, I mean, that is what Dark Factory itself, the whole novel is about, is people coming to these points of connection with everybody else and saying, and you're seeing all these people's backstories that are bringing them to this place and saying, how did everybody get here? And what are they all gonna do now that they're here? And there are big transcendent experiences keep happening and it's crazy pants. So I, love that. I still need to read it. I'm having so much fun with this book, but it is bigger and weirder than anything that I've done. And it's just, wow. So, wow. Did you ever used to go to clubs? I did. I love to dance. I love to dance. And that to me was the whole, and if you're in a place that has a really good sound system and you can feel it in you. I went to an event back when there were events, um, put on by some Detroit techno people and the sound system was just immaculate and it was incredibly loud but not painful or punishing you didn't feel like ah Jesus Christ it was so loud that it just sort of took you over but you could still have a reasonable conversation with someone if you wanted to without screaming in their ear it was just immaculate and it sounds like the perfect level Oh, you could, and you could just dance for hours and hours and hours and you never got tired and you never felt, and there were some very good DJs that night too, that were just, they knew how to flow. It was, yeah, I would gladly do that. I will be doing that again. Once we can be with other humans, that is high on my list of things. I want to go to the club with you. We have to go, we'll go to the club. We'll go to the club when we have the Wuthering Heights weekend, right? The Wuthering Heights, Kathy Earnshaw last weekend <laughs> which brings me to the last item from the shelf okay awesome. this is the only book in my house that i keep in plastic and there's a reason for it this is a copy of watering heights that we used in the production of the heights which was an immersive retelling of watering heights where people came to a gallery space and there were sheets of plastic all over that were veiling people from like the world beyond where Kathy could come and go. There was a big tub of graveyard dirt on the floor and where Kathy was buried and Heathcliff tried to dig her up and we gave people handfuls of dirt. The wonderful Rachel Harbert went around giving people handfuls of like pressing this dirt into their hands. And some people were super into it and they were like, oh my God. And they posted on Insta afterwards and said, look, I have dirt from the heights. And some people could not get rid of it fast enough. They were creeped out by the whole situation. So it sounds like the best thing ever. Oh, this book, and this is a copy of Wuthering Heights. I hope it can be like, I have to keep it in here because it has actual dirt on its Wow. And this was buried underground for six months. I dug a hole in my yard when I knew that we were doing the show and I buried this book. Wow. And it was a highly spiritual experience and I didn't expect it to be, but oh, it is wow. one super, it's got dirt and, and I buried it like naked, just like this. I didn't put it in anything. I just buried it in the ground because I wanted to see the whole idea was Kathy is back from, you know, Kathy is, is dead, but not dead. And we had structured it. So all the people came into the performance space and Kathy actually came in a different entrance. She had to climb up a ladder. She's super game. 
but Rachel climbed up the ladder to enter. So she was entering a space with a locked door and everyone was looking this way and then she came in the other way. So it was like this total shock of, I'm back, right? Oh was, man, that just gave me a really cool idea. I wanted to do like a, a ghost tour for Hazel Drew whenever we do Clash, oh, Clash which will probably be in uh, probably 2021, honestly. Um, uh, but that just gave me an idea. It'd be really cool to like have somebody like reenact the murder. Oh yeah. Like, so, be a, that, or you, cool. like Hazel comes along with you on the tour and Hazel tells you about the things that happened, right? This is where this happened. This is where I was like working for these sketchy people. This is where I did this. This is where I did that. This yeah, is that would be really cool. You got to really find the right, the right person. Oh yeah, that. yeah everything yeah. you had. But yeah, this is where they killed me. You but know, I want to make it like real for people, you know, and, and it's really exciting when you are actually in the location where something happened and then reenacting it and like seeing it like, I think that would really make it, you know, very real. And you wouldn't even necessarily have to do like a reenactment. You could have, if, again, everything turns on this performer, but if you had the right performer yes. and she is saying, here is where they killed me, and then this is how I was killed, and this is what they did with my body. That would make the hair stand out. I mean, oh, you're like, yeah. and you just spent an hour with this person getting to know them and liking them, and they're telling you this stuff, and then it's like, here's where they killed me, and then after that, you leave her there, and the tour goes away on its own, and she has to stay behind because she's dead. And then, after, and then after she's like hanging out with everybody. Right, and then she comes to the after thing yeah. and says, hi. <laughs> Like don't uh, drink. <laughs> no, it it those kinds of, of experiences I think are super powerful and they're yeah. they're in the right way they're entertaining because they're totally again it's like taking you out of yourself and you become part of this person's experience while it's happening. I mean that's what our art is supposed to do anyway, right? Is bring you into a different experience and make you feel it like it's your own. So yeah. But that. yeah, no, that is, a, that is an excellent idea. You should totally do that. So are you going to do anything for Halloween? Realistically, probably not because I, although I was, I don't know if we're doing it on actual Halloween. I shouldn't say that. Besides leaving out the bowl of candy, I don't know if it's Halloween or the day after, which I think it's like All Saints Day or something, right? And, yeah. and the Day of the Dead too. And Day of the Dead. So we made another writer invited me to be part of an event that they are coordinating with the bookstore now that will be like either a Halloween or a Day of the Dead party. Oh, cool. Um, so that would be kind of cool if we can make that work out, but I'm not 100% sure yet. Oh, the date's not set, or the, the it's not we, set. Yet. I, they, I can't say, because no one has said yet that it's for sure, but it looks. And on the, the 29th, I'll be part of... Um, DePaul University in Chicago asked me to be part of an event they call Horror of the Humanities. The Humanities Department puts it on every year. And in fact, I was there for the first inaugural one, so they asked me to come back. And last year, Ari Aster was the main guest. And oh, wow. Very cool. Yeah. So they get, they get really cool people. And so I'm really cool people. So I get to go to. You are. You're super cool. But this is a Zoom year, so. Yeah. I do a live performance of a brand new piece called Black Tambourine. And I'm looking forward to that with great excitement. And because it's live, you know, we won't know how, we won't know until we do it. So I'm really excited. That's exciting. And that's the, so. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. What so about much. you? What are you doing? What, what are am you I doing? doing? I'm, what am I doing? Well, I'm, oh yeah. The, well, the last whole week, my friend is coming. He's coming and he's the one that I've been doing all the ghost hunting and everything with. So we're going to go, oh, cool. we're going to go revisit places. Um, see, see, you know, kind of, we're just like retracing all her steps. He's actually working on a book we're going to publish next year called oh. Hate was a good girl. And it is an actual like true crime investigation. Um, so he's really like hardcore, like actually investigating, like pouring through newspapers, like finding any witness accounts he can get of like people that knew her and stuff. Um, 
So we're gonna be doing that. Um, he and his wife actually uh, rented a, uh, got an Airbnb. Uh, they got this like mansion in Troy. So oh, um, cool. I'm gonna kind of get a little vacation from my house too and get to stay in the spooky old mansion. Yeah. We're gonna do a seance. We're gonna do a, like an old school seance. Oh. I'd be careful <laughs> for her for yeah. Make hopefully, sure her is, like hopefully a good friend this comes. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming you're going to talk to Hazel. Yeah, yeah, for her to talk to her. Yeah, um, and we'll make the incense, and um, and then uh, next month it kind of ties in the same thematically. I'm uh, I I came up with a, a workshop to do that is um, a writing workshop and a conjuring workshop where I want people to, um, where I'm gonna help people connect with uh, some kind of energy, whether it be a God or a spirit or something, um, and then create a piece of writing in partnership with the spirit that they are oh, wow. connecting. So we will be doing, a communal seance via Zoom, <laughs> a Zoom seance, just like the movie, that movie. Right, I know, right? <laughs> um, uh, on Friday the 13th of November, which is crazy. Like, I, I did not realize it was Friday the 13th, but I was like, okay, we'll do the seance on the second Zoom classroom meeting, and then I go look at the calendar, and it's Friday the 13th. And I've got 13 people signed up for this workshop. So it's going to be, it's going to be wild. That would be fun. Be so, but, uh, I mean, always, whenever I have had those kind, and when, when experiences are authentic and not when people are like, wah, ha, ha, you know, whatever. Like the guy in the movie who's like, wah, ha, ha, what did I miss? Of course he got his, but the, there's so much talk about energy right there's so much energy loose and yeah it will be yeah like I don't, be yeah i mean i don't expect everybody to be like actually connecting with an actual dead person you know which is why i left it open-ended like archetypes you know so different people right. like somebody in the class actually uh one of the writers we published she she signed up for it i was actually surprised but she's like very brainy she's she's got a She's a philosophy PhD and professor, and she wrote Hexus, Charlene Elby. Yep. Um, and she, so she's going to try to uh, channel Pythagoras, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah. Sweet. <laughs> so oh, I'm, sweet. Like, I'm so excited to see what she writes in partnership with, with, um, with him. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm very excited. Uh, the way I'm going to do the seance is I'm going to have each person. So it's not going to be like, I'm not going to try to channel anything and do like some, because I don't want to do that, like do some stupid performance and feel ridiculous. And, you know, I want this to be a real experience. So we're going to be together, but each communing with our own spirit. And I'm going to have each person, we'll have the camera on obviously on Zoom, but I want each person not looking there, looking actually at themselves in the mirror with a candle working with their own spirit so we're like together but apart and I, I feel like everybody doing it is going to really magnify that energy and it's good to not have it be performative that yeah, it's I not that. because it, it would be incredibly difficult anyway it would, it would be, be okay. so hard I mean that's so much pressure <laughs> that's and and it, right, and then when things start to happen, what am I going to stop when I'm doing the fault because someone is having this? So am I not paying attention? Right? See, there you go. Door opens. Door closes. <laughs> yeah, like, okay. <laughs> cool. That will be really cool. Yeah, I'm so excited. I like. I literally. I was sitting in this room here with the blue walls, and and it, I got the idea, and then I posted on Facebook. I'm like, hey, would anybody be interested in? And immediately there was interest. So hopefully, you know, if everything goes well and the interest continues, it's something I can keep doing because it's something that, like you said, fun. You know, I I'm I'm so busy and I'm constantly working. So like I don't want to add anything to my plate that isn't fun. So like yeah. with the programming on Clash TV, like I want to talk to people I enjoy talking to, and this it can't feel like work, you know. And like you know, talking to someone yeah. like you. It, it's a it's always a pleasure you know it doesn't feel like it, ne it would never feel like work you know 
And that's, and that's how you invite other people in to have fun. I mean, when I'm, if I'm sitting in a coffee place like I used to, and someday I will again, but if people are having a really animated, fun conversation, it's not like you're listening to them, but it's like, wow, that's a, they're having fun. They're having a good time. And yeah, or someone spreads the good vibes. And, right. And, rather yeah. than something morosely having some kind of horrible business thing where you're like, oh God, I'm going to move my chair. <laughs> I don't want to be by oh, that. I just like love my candle. Wow. Okay. Well, I guess that means. All right. That's the signal. <laughs> well, well, thank you. I'm glad that I am the first person to show my shelves and I look forward to seeing what other people have on their shelves. And like, thank you. you know, I appreciate it so much. I, I love no, it. Was fun. Well, it's always fun. It's always fun. That's why I say yes, because I know we're going to have a good time. All right. So uh, any quick uh, promo stuff you want to say? Um, I think everyone on earth should probably get both of these books. And if you have never read anything of mine, you might start with Velocities. And if you like the voice, then you go on to the cipher. If you're already familiar with me, especially if you have read this book before, I think you should read it again. And you should also have it for the wonderful and prescient and heartfelt Maurice Meyer afterward that is in this edition of the cipher. So everybody needs to do that immediately and be on board for Dark Factory, which I am planning to have out in some species next year, but it will be a very different project. So I'm not yet sure of its, its final form, but right I'm looking forward to that very much. Cool. Send me the links and I'll add them to the post of the video. Yes. Thank you. No, good idea. Well, this has been fabulous. I hope you have a, a wonderful month this month and, you know, everything, but and a super happy Halloween. And I personally will probably get jacked up on uh, gummies of some kind because that would be my candy of choice. I'll be getting jacked up on, uh, you know, on uh, THC gummies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's out of my pay grade. No, just regular <laughs> will fuck me up just fine. <laughs> All right, Sweet Pea, thank you for having me. All right, thank you.